And a very, very pleasant good day to each and every one of you. I'm Brother James, and I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And I welcome you to the Preaching of the Cross radio broadcast. This is the ministry of the Bible Baptist Church of Deland, Florida, heard by the grace of God on this radio station and many others around this world. And we uh, certainly uh, thank God that you've tuned into the program today and believe that God will make the program a blessing to you. Uh, somebody passed this along to me. Uh, it says, uh, there are thousands of men who can easily endure to be knocked down by misfortune, but who are utterly destroyed if lifted up to success. Satan takes them to the top of the pinnacle of the temple and shoves them off. Their heads begin to whirl and they lose their balance, and down they go. Just a little note, may God help us to be as careful to pray when things are going well, as we are when things are going uh, going wrong. May God help us to be as careful to seek His face and, and to trust Him when uh, things seem to be looking up as we do uh, when uh, things seem to be looking down. I think that's a good word of admonition and a good word of advice with which to start the program today. We've been discussing the mysteries of the New Testament, the mystery doctrines found in the New Testament, we are into a section of our study which deals with the dispensational mysteries. We're not going to argue with you on this series about whether or not uh, there are dispensations in the Bible because the Bible says there are dispensations in the Bible and the study of the Word of God reveals those dispensations to those that believe the book. Those that don't believe the Bible, uh, we wonder why they ever bother to read it or study it or teach it unless they're just trying to get an offering out of somebody or unless their ego requires that uh, they... Uh, gain a following of some kind, but if the Bible speaks of uh, rightly dividing the word of truth, then we have sense enough to uh, realize that there are divisions in the word of God. Uh, that should be clear to anyone. Now, under these dispensational mysteries, we have studied the mystery of the kingdom of heaven, we have studied the mystery of Israel's blindness, and on the program today we are going to study the mystery of the catching away, the calling out, the rapture of the New Testament church. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. You say, what does he mean by not sleeping? What does he mean by being changed? Well, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we, that is those who aren't dead, shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The blessed hope held by the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ during this day and age of grace is that we may not all pass through death's door, but we may be changed from a living state in a mortal body to a glorified state in an everlasting glorified body. And that's our subject today, the mystery of this great change. The second coming of Christ is one of the main themes of the Holy Scriptures. There are hundreds of references, both in the Old and New Testaments, concerning his visible return to the earth, when every eye shall see him. He will then put down all opposition to God and will reign for 1,000 years. These scriptures should not be spiritualized or any attempt made to explain them away. They mean what they say if words have any meaning at all. But a secret coming prior to his visible appearing to remove a select company of his people to heaven before judgment falls upon the apostate earth is a truth never mentioned in the Old Testament except in picture form. This secret snatching away of the church is uh, called by believers the rapture. Now, it is true that in the typical portions of the Old Testament, there are a number of illustrations of a secret rapture, but no direct teaching. For instance, Enoch, in the wicked days before the flood, 
walked with God for 300 years, and he was translated that he should not see death before the judgment of the deluge came. Paul seems to have this in mind when he exhorts the believers at Thessalonica to walk and to please God just as Enoch did. And then he proceeds to reveal the rapture in the same context in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Lot is another example of a believer being removed before judgment falls. This time the scene is Sodom and Gomorrah. Although he was a carnal believer, living in a place where he shouldn't have been, yet God calls him that righteous man in 2 Peter 2.8 and says that that righteousness is one of the soul, though sadly it was not one of outward life and character. And God takes steps to remove Lot from the avalanche of fire and brimstone that was poured out on the cities of the plain. We find the same principle in the case of Elijah, the prophet who was translated without dying, 2 Kings chapter 2. Looking back from our vantage point of the revelation of the doctrine in the New Testament, we can see these pictures and types. Yet in the Old Testament, there is no direct teaching of the second coming of Christ being in two stages. First, a secret uh, rapture of the church and then his visible public appearing in glory to reign. This is the reason Paul in 1 Corinthians 15.51 calls it a mystery. That is something that hitherto has not been revealed. It is most important to understand the truth that there is a decided difference between the secret catching away of the church and the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ in his kingdom glory. Now, in the New Testament, there are four main passages that speak of this catching away. First, in the upper room ministry of Jesus Christ, in John 14, verses 1 through 3. Here the Lord is meeting with his uh, disciples, not with the world. Here the Lord is meeting with believers, not with unbelievers. Here the Lord is in company with the saints, not a mixed company. And he says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. It would be impossible for the Lord Jesus Christ to outline and detail the coming judgments of the great tribulation. When the sun is dark and the moon is turned to blood. When uh, death and hell and pestilence and famine ride across this earth. When waters are poisoned. When fires, great fires sweep the earth, destroying the vegetation. When the... Uh, gates of hell are opened and the inhabitants of hell come forth upon this earth to torment men and so on and so forth it would be impossible for the Lord to outline these terrible tribulation judgments and then smiling say let not your heart be troubled but in John 14 too, he goes on to say in my father's house not on this earth in my father's house not a place on this planet in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go. All right, he's, he's on the earth. His destination on the earth, he has already stated. He's going to, to Jerusalem. He's going to be betrayed. He's going to be condemned. He's going to be nailed to a cross outside the city gates. He's going to be put to death and then rise again. That's his future on this earth. But when he says, I go... He's speaking of his return, his ascension to the Father's house. I go to prepare a place for you. The Lord Jesus Christ, not only will he ascend and return back to his Father's house, but he is going there with a purpose, and his purpose in returning to the Father's house is to prepare a place for believers. Verse number 3, And if I go, which he has done, and prepare a place for you, which he is doing, I will come again to set up a kingdom on this earth. No, that's not what he said. Not to the church, not to believers, not to disciples. To them he says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Where I am there, ye may be also, and whither I go, ye you know, and the way, ye you know. In the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the teaching of Christ concerning his second coming emphasizes his appearing in glory to reign in his kingdom, preceded by a time of tribulation. 
The parallel passages in Matthew 24 and 25, Mark 13 and Luke 21 make this very clear. But the teaching in John 14 here is very, very different. As we've shown, here he is coming to receive his own to the Father's house. He emphasizes that the place is not on earth, but in heaven. And then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul, writing under the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit, emphasizes not the place, but the person who is coming. The person who is coming. It is the Lord himself. Paul had been in Thessalonica only three weeks at the founding of the church. During that time, he had no doubt given the believers an outline of teaching concerning the second coming of Christ. But there was some confusion in their minds regarding the order of events. Because persecution had followed their conversion, they were wondering if the day of the Lord had not already come with his tribulation and judgment. Some of their number had died since Paul had been there. And so they had missed the glorious experience of being raptured to heaven without dying of which he had spoken. This letter that we, that we know as, as 1 Thessalonians was uh, written to set their minds at rest upon these points, to tell them what would happen to those who were alive and to tell them what would happen to those believers who had already died, those on earth and those in the grave. And what did the Holy Spirit have him record about this blessed event? In verse 13 of chapter 4, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Brethren, now see, this is only for believers. It's only for those who have God as their Father. It's only for those who have been born again into the family of God. But for them, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Those who have no hope beyond the grave, those who have no hope of a resurrection, those who have no hope that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming again to receive them unto himself, those that have no hope that he's gone to prepare a mansion for them, they sorrow, they grieve, they mourn with uncontrollable sorrow and with uh, grief and agony that cannot be uh, taken away. But not those of us who know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. For us, a graveside service is a parting of the ways for a time. For us, that funeral service and that memorial service is a temporary separation. Why? Verse 14. For if we believe. Notice, not if we work for. For if we believe. Notice, not if we've done enough. For if we believe. Notice, not if we belong or have joined. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again. There's the gospel. Christ died for our sins, was buried, and the third day Jesus rose again. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus. Now, you can't get in Jesus after you go to sleep. You can't get in Jesus after you die. You must be in Christ now. You must be ready to die, ready to face death, so that when you fall asleep, you can fall asleep being one that is in Christ Jesus by the new birth. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. I'm not making this up. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself should ascend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise. First, why do we not sorrow as others? Why do we not grieve as others? Why do we not mourn as others who have no hope? Because we have a hope promised us by the Lord Jesus Christ, given to us in the word of God, that those that have gone to sleep in Jesus Christ will rise from the dead. Then, we which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. 
I realize there are those listening to my voice right now. I realize there are those that teach on this radio station. I realize there are those who would teach in the pulpit. I realize there are those who have been uh, misled in their own Bible reading to believe that there is no difference between the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to this earth and the catching away of believers to meet the Lord in the air. But my friends, why would Jesus catch his church up into the clouds and then say, whoop, just kidding, and take us right back down to the earth? Strange business indeed. You say, well, that's to uh, get them through the uh, terrible uh, judgments that will take place uh, at his uh, second coming. Uh, No, 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 no. There's an ark of safety for those. Uh, Noah is the picture of that. Enoch is the picture of the church escaping before tribulation. Noah is the picture of the Jewish remnant passing through the tribulation. And there's quite a vast difference there that if a man doesn't understand, he ought not to be teaching in the first place. Now, our blessed hope our hope that comforts us in times of sorrow, in times of death, in times of bereavement, is that the Lord himself shall descend. So we have the place, the Father's house. We have the person, the Lord Jesus Christ. The third passage dealing with this rapture is in Philippians chapter number 3. And in Philippians 3, we read in verses 20 and 21 for our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for the savior the lord jesus christ i hope you're not looking for a savior to come from washington dc i hope you're not looking for a savior to come from moscow or london i hope you're not looking for a savior to come from tokyo or from the vatican our savior comes from heaven he's the lord jesus christ who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Here we are told that our conversation, our citizenship is in heaven, and that the Lord will change our vile body. Here the rapture and the transformation of the body of believers, which take place at this time, is all part of the glorious purpose for the Christian. This chapter is autobiographical, if you will. Paul outlines his own life, commencing with his unconverted days as a self-righteous Pharisee, when the Lord arrested him and reoriented his life. He was taken into God's school and taught the vital lessons that would govern his service. He started on a long-distance race, with his eye on the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And at the end of the chapter is the blessed hope, rounding out the purpose of God in the believer's life, changing his body, carrying him up into uh, the Father's house where he enjoys the presence of the Lord forevermore. Then the fourth passage, which deals with the rapture, is 1 Corinthians 15 that we read at the start of the program. And there's a problem. In the church at Corinth, there were some who had doubts, or who even went so far as to deny the resurrection of the body. Among the Jews, the Sadducees, and among the Gentiles, the Epicureans, denied this great fundamental truth. The Apostle Paul encountered this at Athens, where the philosophers mocked when he mentioned the resurrection of the dead, Acts 17.32. Later, when he was being examined by the Sanhedrin, in Acts 23, the issue of the resurrection caused an uproar between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. We are told that the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but Pharisees confess both. Now apparently this pagan and Sadducean denial of the resurrection had affected the church at Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 15, the apostle expounds the doctrine of the resurrection body. First, he points out that it is one of the fundamentals of the gospel. Then, he bases the doctrine on the bodily resurrection of Christ. Did Christ rise from the dead in the same body in which he had lived and was crucified? Yes, he did. Then his bodily resurrection is the great test, the great pattern, the great prototype of the resurrection of the body. In verse 35 of 1 Corinthians 15, Paul asks two questions. But some man will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Well, he answers the last question first. 
in verses 36 to 41, he uses three illustrations to describe the nature of the resurrection body of the believer. The first is taken from botany, the seed and the harvest. The second is taken from biology, four different kinds of flesh, that of men, of beasts, of fish, and of birds. Each is adapted to the environment where God has placed it. And the third is taken from astronomy, the relative glories of the sun, moon, and stars. These three illustrations show the difference between the earthly body and the glory of the heavenly resurrection body of the believer. Then the final paragraph in this great chapter, verses 51 to 58, is the answer to the question of verse 35, How are the dead raised up? The Holy Spirit has Paul write and record, Behold, I show you a mystery. You see, it's being revealed. It's being made known. I'll show it to you. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. Here again is one of God's great mysteries revealed for the first time by and through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. The Apocalypse and the Epiphany of Christ, His public visible appearing as the Son of Man, described by the prophets in the Old Testament and by our Lord in Matthew 24 and 25, is not a mystery. But this is. Here He comes to raise the dead and change the living. Some will not die but we'll be caught up. It will be instantaneous. It will be in a moment. It will be in an atom of time. It will be in the twinkling of an eye. It will be at the last trump. And I hope you're ready, because when that Lord sounds, that trumpet calls, there'll be no time then to get ready. You've got to be ready before the alarm is given. Now, some shallow Bible teachers and students have taken the last trump to be identical with the seventh trumpet of Revelation 11.15 and would postpone the rapture until the end of the Great Tribulation. But Paul could not have been referring to the book of Revelation as it was not written until at least 35 years later. And it very plainly tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5.9 that God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. You have trumpets in Revelation chapter 11, but in 1 Corinthians 15 you have a trump, that is the sounding of a trumpet. Now, in Numbers chapter number 10, we read about silver trumpets. They were used for gathering the elders and the whole congregation. They were used at their set feasts. They were used for warfare. They were blown for sacrifices. They were blown for the movements of the whole camp. When it came time to march, the trumpets would sound and the people would prepare to move, prepare to make ready and begin marching, begin moving at the last trump. That is the final note sounded by the trumpet. At that moment, they would move. When the Lord sounds that heavenly trumpet and plays that heavenly bugle call, the dead in Christ shall come to life. Those living in the Lord Jesus Christ shall be energized and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And when the last note of that trumpet call shall sound at that last trump, they shall rise up together to meet the Lord in the air. The apostle uses two terms to describe the two classes of God's people at the rapture the corruptible and the mortal. The corruptible are those who have died and are in the grave. The mortal are the living but liable to death. The quotation is from a lovely passage in Isaiah 25, 8, which describes the glory of the kingdom age when death is swallowed up in victory. But at the rapture, the mortal, that is, those who are alive and remain, will fling the challenge at death. O death, where is thy sting? And the corruptible, as they rise from the tomb, will cry, O grave, where is thy victory? And both together, the dead, who have been raised, and the living, are changed, and they rise to meet the Lord in the air. The Apostle Paul closes this wondrous passage with a note of triumph. Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then, A word of exhortation and encouragement. Therefore, 
because of these things, therefore, in light of these truths, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. How about you, my friends? Are you ready? Should Jesus call today? Are you ready? Should the Lord descend this day? Are you ready? Should the trumpet sound? When the roll is called up yonder, will you be there? It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy that He saved us. Not by good deeds, not by memberships, not by affiliations, not by giving, but only trust Him, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's done all that needs to do for a man to be saved. He's the only one that can save you. But oh, if you'll call upon Him from a sincere and believing heart, trusting that the death that He died was to pay for your sins, trusting that three days and three nights later He rose from the dead, God will give you His free gift of eternal and everlasting life, freely bestowed on all who believe. Amen and amen. This is the Preaching of the Cross radio broadcast. Our mailing address is 199 Damascus Road. 199 Damascus Road. That's in Deland, D-E-L-A-N-D, Deland, Florida. The zip code number is 32724. And that mailing address is in the United States of America. Zip code number 32724. Mailing address, the United States of America. The announcer will be on now in just a moment to let you know when this program will be heard again over this radio station. And we hope and pray that at that time, you and a friend that you invite to listen with you will join us for the Preaching of the Cross radio broadcast. Until then, I'm Brother James. May the Lord richly bless you, and good day.